All right, listeners, I think you know that we are part of the Radiotopia Network, which is basically a network built on the idea that you should support the most creative, independent audio makers around. No one, and I mean no one, embodies the Radiotopia ethos more than Benjamin Walker and his show, Theory of Everything. Benjamin, who I've known for a long time, has been making beautiful, personal, sprawling audio documentaries for decades that help us understand the very strange world we live in. And now he has a new series called Not All Propaganda is Art. The new series goes back to the 1950s, when Western security agencies like the CIA paid artists, writers, and intellectuals to fight the cultural Cold War. The CIA funds were free. I mean, no one was told what to say. Gloria Steinem, activist who sees the CIA as a sort of enlightened pal or rich uncle, there is another viewpoint. Look, if you're listening to this show, I know you like secret histories. I know you like a mix of culture and politics and shadowy figures. So what are you waiting for? Not all propaganda is art from Benjamin Walker. You can find it now wherever you listen or at theoryofeverythingpodcast.com. This episode is brought to you by Progressive, where drivers who save by switching save nearly $750 on average. Quote now at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates, national average 12-month savings of $744 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2022 and May 2023. Potential savings will vary. Hey everyone, Jody here. It is that week between Christmas and New Year's, hopefully one in which you're getting some time off or some time to catch up on things, or maybe you're right back at it. Um, Over the next week, we're going to be running some special episodes, a couple favorites from 2021, and then a two-part special we recorded looking back at the year, following up on some of the stuff we missed. Now, one quick note, it is the end of the year, so I would be remiss if I didn't point out that we couldn't make this show without the direct support of our listeners. So if you are thinking about some year-end giving, thinking about the things that matter to you this year, consider becoming a member of Radiotopia and supporting this show and all the other shows on the network. You can find a form on our website, thisdaypod.com. Once again, thisdaypod.com if you want to become a member. Anyway, thank you for listening. Thank you for supporting throughout the year. Here we go. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, June 3rd, 1943, the start of the Zoot Suit Riots in Los Angeles. Zoot Suit Riot, it's kind of fun to say, but the story itself is not very fun. It is full of all sorts of interesting layers. Uh, The Zoot Suit Riots were, in effect, a series of racially motivated attacks over the course of a week or so. Tensions had been brewing between the Mexican-American community in Los Angeles and the mostly white servicemen who were in L.A. preparing to deploy to the Pacific Theater in World War II. The Zoot Suit Riots were when it all burst out into the open with groups and gangs clashing in the streets. We'll go through this kind of piece by piece because there are so many layers here. There's racial tension, the way that World War II put a lot of class and cultural and generational issues into sharp relief, the way the press egged on these riots and attacks. And at the heart of it all was the Zoot Suit, a flashy style of dress that became a flashpoint for many of those issues. So... Here to discuss the Zoot Suit Riots are, as always, Nicole Hammer of Columbia and Kelly Carter-Jackson of Wellesley. Hello there. Hello, Jody. Hey there. Um, And our special guest for this episode is my pal Emily Spivak, artist, writer, and the creator of the book and now the amazing new Netflix series, Worn Stories, which highlights the connection people have with clothing. Hello, Emily. Hi, Jody. And uh, I will say Emily thinks a lot about what clothes represent both for individuals and for our culture at large. So we will get to the Zoot Suit in a minute. But I guess, Nikki, can, can you just start by laying out the basic groups in this brewing tension? What's going on when these riots break out? And then, you know, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, so the violence breaks out between two groups, um, Mexican-Americans in Los Angeles and mostly white servicemen who have been shipped to California as part of their military training for uh, World War II. The precipitating event here is kind of interesting. There had been this still unsolved murder called the Sleepy Lagoon murder of this Mexican-American man, and the police rounded up 
just a large group of Latino men and accuse them of the murder. They would ultimately be cleared of it. Um, But the reason that's important is because it fed into this narrative that Mexican men, that Latino men were sources of criminality and violence in Los Angeles. And these white servicemen presented themselves as sort of a, a force of order. In Los Mm -hmm. Angeles. And so they begin to have these street clashes, um, which will culminate in violence against Latino men in the Zoot Suit riots. Yeah. And if I could add just a little more context, like we've done a lot of episodes that talk about racial tensions of the time and sort of trying to uh, get ridding of particular groups. We've talked about this with um, the Seattle riot as well. And it's very similar, I think, here in L.A., where we think about these racial tensions in which Mexicans are being othered and people see them as draft dodgers. They see them as extravagant. Uh, They see them as infringing upon, you know, their either political or social spaces. And so All of this tension is really sort of drawing to a head when we Mm -hmm. have um, these major clashes. And just to add one more note to this, they also see them as job stealers. Um, There is a massive move in the 1930s and early 1940s where there's just a mass deportation of Mexican immigrants and Mexican Americans. Like we're talking almost two million people, half of which were U.S. citizens. And it's obviously illegal to just eject a million U.S. citizens because of their race. Um, But that is what happened. And Emily, in this really interesting way, the zoot suit, which you can describe what a zoot suit is, becomes a sort of symbol of so many of the issues that we just described. Yeah, it's um, I think that there are a lot of garments through history that represent, you know, political uprisings, political upheaval. um, And I think that this is one really interesting example. And and also just the the style, the garment itself is fascinating to me, too. You want to describe it? I mean, in my understanding, it is it's a suit that uses a lot of material, a lot of fabric, which, uh, you know, and uh, I wish I, I had like actual numbers or something because it feels like it's, you know, you look at it and it looks at, like it's like two times the amount of fabric that you would have for a regular suit that we see today. The pants were extremely baggy. The coat was very long, came down to about the knee, um, also very oversized. The pants were pegged at the bottom and the suit itself, also the, the jacket kind of came, got narrower. So it, you almost looked like, you know, you were a little bit of like a walking triangle, um, upside Mm. down, you know, um, where it was wider at the top and, and got narrower and narrower. You were dressed up too, which I think is just, is, you know, you were wearing dress shoes, you were wearing, you know, a dress shirt, from, you know, just looking at it today, I think it, it's beautiful. Flashy colors to bright, flashy colors, orange and greens and pale blues and not your traditional suit color, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> your staple navy <laughs> or black. <laughs> so what was it um, about the suit that felt like it became a, that made it such a flashpoint in the, all the other tensions that we're describing? Well, one of the major things was that in the middle of World War II, we've talked about how there were rations, and those rations extended to fabric. And so one of the arguments made against the Zoot Suit was that these people who wore them were being indulgent, right? And they were not sacrificing for the war. And so it quickly becomes um, not just that you're flouting the rations, but that you're un-American, that you don't support the war. And that feeds into all of those other pre-existing racist ideas about um, Mexicans and Mexican-Americans in Los Angeles. And so it's a way in which the the very stuff of the suit becomes part of the political and racial conflict. Emily, do you want to jump in on the rations? Because I know you've written a little bit about that in that context. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's, it's so interesting because, um, you know, around this time also, um, I had this blog for the Smithsonian and wrote many years ago about uh, rationing of nylon and Mm -hmm. nylon stockings. And so, you know, nylon was invented just a handful of years, from what I recall, um, before World War II. And it was introduced to the world um, and introduced to the U.S. as, you know, potentially for nylon stockings. And women loved them, flocked to them because they'd been wearing silk stockings prior to that and they were not nearly as durable. Um, but then they had to, it was like they, they tempted everyone and they said, here, you can have these amazing stockings, you know, these nylon stockings. I think women were going through at that point, like 
you know, eight pairs of stockings a year. And then they were, they yanked them back and they said, no, you can't use them. We actually have to use the nylon for parachutes um, and for other things that are associated with the war effort. And when they did come back, uh, there were also these nylon stocking riots, but they were, you know, involved women standing in department store lines for hours and hours, you know, miles long lines to get their nylon stockings when they were available again. But it wasn't, you know, I mean, I think in in that case, it didn't feel so political. It didn't, mm. it, you know, and it, and it wasn't an indicator and it wasn't something that you were walking around making a statement. Mm. You know, it wasn't like you were you were marking yourself in some way. It's interesting, though. I just think because Mexican-Americans are already marked like by their ethnicity so that the clothing is like an additional layer, no pun intended, but like an additional <laughs> layer of how people perceived them and and targeted them as a result of this. But I mean, there, there's so much I think that's cultural here, too, because when we think about when I think about black culture and Latino culture, like we like to get dressed up, we like to look cute. Like it, there's so much of a culture of adornment that is part of um, black and brown ethnicity about looking good. And a lot of that, too, stems from poverty or the inability to obtain respect because of white supremacy. So the dressing up and the adornment is a way to sort of claim not just your identity and expression, but your uh, ability to be able to be seen and um, respected. Hmm. And we should clarify that the Zoot Suit, from what we can tell, did kind of move from black community into the mm-hmm. Latino community. But mm-hmm. Emily, go ahead. Well, it just also makes me, you know, I'm thinking about as it relates to where we are today, um, you know, in in Warren's stories, we interviewed um, Congresswoman Frederica Wilson. She's known for wearing her very distinctive uh, cowboy hats. Mm-hmm. And she talks about, you know, her ensemble. And what she talks about is, you know, they are brightly colored. They're very vibrant. And she, you know, she's a black woman in Congress. And she says, I wear them to get noticed. And she says, and I'm quoting from the show, you know, it helps her get shit done. Um, (laughs) And, uh, you know, so so they're having that sort of like kind of noticeable garment. It's a form of creative expression, but it also can really, you know, help you in your work and and help you make a statement in so many other ways. And I think that that connection between black fashion and Latino fashion is important because it ties in the white imagination Latinos to African-Americans. Um, and so in a, in the U.S., a lot of times um, racial identity of brown people is sort of calculated by nearness to black people. And so I think that element is really important to highlight. Okay. Right. And then you have like, you know, thinking about Trayvon Martin and the hoodie and what the hoodie symbolizes. I mean, even the fact there's an artist, uh, David Hammonds, who made um, an artwork. Uh, I think I cannot remember what it was called, but basically it was, you know, a disembodied hoodie that he like tacked up to a wall, Um, you know. And so this is something that, you know, that also is just an indicator as well, I think. Well, I mean, I think it's that in some way, clothing is going to be a proxy for racial othering in both directions, right? Either you're dressing Mm -hmm. down and you're dressing like a thug or, oh, you're dressing up too much, right? And you're stepping Mm -hmm. out of line, right? I mean, it's just Mm -hmm. either way, it's going to kind of get politicized in that way. And Mm -hmm. I think there's also this World War II context is important too. I mean, I don't think it's a coincidence that we're talking about a moment at which there's rising jingoism in the united states we're entering the pacific theater there is tons of anti-asian sentiment and and if you look at 1943 there were there were not zoot suit riots in other cities but there were riots um against black and brown people in other cities Mm -hmm. often by servicemen who i think for since pearl harbor a couple years earlier had been kind of um gassed up in in terms of um the sort of racial elements of of our involvement in world war ii This is really important because one of the elements of this story that you mentioned in the intro, Jody, is the way that the press helped to stoke some of this sentiment. Um, There was a a guide in one L.A. paper on how to de-zoot a zoot suitor, which is how to 
how to take their clothes off, which was part of the violence here. It was not only beating um, people wearing zoot suits, um, but also taking their suits off. And this is at the same time that Life magazine is printing guides on how to tell the difference between a Chinese person and a Japanese person. So in part because people were beating up Chinese people thinking that they were Japanese. And Life was basically saying, it's okay to beat up Japanese immigrants and Japanese Americans. They're the enemy. Um, But just make sure that you don't hit one of our, somebody associated with our allies, a Chinese immigrant or a Chinese American. It's just, to me, the, the violence of this moment is not just about causing harm it's also about causing humiliation yeah. so by you know de- stripping mm-hmm. someone down taking their pants taking them their clothes having them sit in the middle of the street in their undergarments to gawk at them and to laugh at them it's an expose and in the same way that you know we think of like lynchings or these massive mob attacks on people. Um, these same things are like motivated by the collective gawk, by people being able to look at it and to sort of scorn or point to what they believe is like the um, the cause of of their you know n- nuisance or social nuisance or deviance. Um, however you want to sort of categorize it, that's how Latino men are seen in this moment. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how these riots play out. I mean, one thing we should know is, yeah, it's over the course of about a week or so. There's just roving skirmishes, as we're saying. The police are often uh, either looking the other way, if not enabling uh, the white mobs. After a few days, it's about 150 people have been injured. The police have arrested over 500 Latino civilians and the charges are, you know, rioting to vagrancy. Uh, it's interesting, too, because, you know, they, this was a coordinated effort. Mm-hmm. And when I say coordinated, taxi cabs like came together and said, hey, you want to ride to the to the Mexican community? Let's go. And they got over 20 uh, taxi cabs to have this convoy of 200 people armed with clubs and whatever they could use to to harm, to hit, to cause violence against Mexican-Americans and, and, and Mexicans in their in their community. So this was not just like a a happenstance this was people coming together to uh be destructive and and certainly as with a lot of stories but i think we're all finding this this story is just so layered i mean it could be like multi parts but you know it it connects to everything else going on including uh not long after the riots the state un-american activities committee is going on and one of the, and a senator a state senator during that says that they that he wants to investigate whether the zoot suit riots were sponsored by nazi agencies attempting to spread disunity between the united states and latin american countries um and so you know again it's just one of these like rorschach test moments where just like everyone gets to impose whatever swirling issues of the day are onto onto these skirmishes. Well, and it's also a way of just sort of washing any responsibility from Mm -hmm. these soldiers who were responsible for so much of the violence. I mean, ultimately, the soldiers are going to be barred from Los Angeles in a way to uh, keep them uh, from committing these kinds of acts of violence. But to say that it's the fault of the Nazis instead of of American racism is uh, one way to wash your hands of it. Yeah. So as we start to wrap up, Emily, I'm curious if you can kind of reflect a little on this conversation we've been having about, um, you know, dressing up as a form of resistance or at least as a form of agency. Your book and your series talk to individuals in many ways about what clothing means to them. But did you do you see that as a through line in some of the in some of the working conversations you've been having? Um. I think what I see, I, I don't necessarily see a pattern. I see a pattern of, of actually, you know, things actually getting imbued with meeting that are very unexpected. Um, so it's not as intentional. It's not something like, you know, I'm going to wear this garment and then, you know, I don't know, become a- affiliated with this group of people. It actually winds up being something where it's it's more like, you know, this T-shirt, this pair of jeans, this thing, you know, um, I was wearing it when this crazy thing happened. I think I don't see it as much of a connection, but I mean, I do... I I do think that we do make these very deliberate choices. Like there's a story in the book about um, a poet and what he wears to meet Obama in the White House. And he, you know, wears this like very dramatic suit, this Tom Brown suit. And it, and again, it is to get noticed and so that he can have a conversation and in, engage with Obama. Um, and I think that there are these moments where it's just like um, associating, you know, 
a highlight, a moment in your life with the thing that you're wearing. And that does happen with, with when we get dressed up. I mean, that's the, that's the most obvious, you know, like what you wore to your wedding, what you wore to your prom, what you wore, you know, you, we make those associations. But at some level, this was fashion and it was just how people wanted to dress because they felt good wearing it. And then it sort of attracts all these other larger levels. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I just want to throw out, you know, something I was thinking about is like, because this is, it is fashion. Whereas like you th- think about something like the MAGA hat, the red hat, the red MAGA hat, which is like, I don't know, you know, if a red hat will ever symbolize, you know, if, if, if anyone will feel comfortable just kind of benignly wearing a red hat ever again. Um, that wasn't like fashion with a capital F, but that was just like a functional indicator of, you know, I am, I am with this pack. I am with, you know, this is who I identify with. And so there, there was no fashion there. That was, to me, that was, that was just purely right. practical and, and wanting to identify with a group. Mm-hmm. I think about it in the same way, too, of like the Black Panthers. You think of like the leather mm-hmm. jackets, the berets, the like, there's so much about social movements that I do think um, fashion tends to shape how we perceive the movement as either, I don't know, something that's threatening or dangerous or cool or um, sexy. Like there are all these ways that, you know, fashion shapes our understanding of who we think someone is or what we think someone's about. Yeah. And I think about, I mean, it, it, it can be as politically overt, but it can also just be like, you know, you think about like the early punk rock scene mm-hmm. where it's like, you know, ripped pants and safety pins and <laughs> um, t-shirts and, and gr- or grunge or, or goth. And it's, it's sort of like, you're just, you're kind of looking across the room at, you know, maybe you're, it's a room full of, of people and you're saying, oh, that's, that's, that's one of my people. Mm -hmm. That's one of my, and, and as an identity, you know, it's, it's, it's an identifier. And so I think that probably, I, you know, I'd love to learn a little bit more about like the beginning of the zoot suit, but that kind of identification and, and that, that like the positive side of it where it's like, oh, here are my people, Mm. you know, Mm. here's my, here's my crew. Here's my, you know, I feel at home with these folks because, you know, look at us all in our zoot suits. And the power of that combination of expression and belonging is pretty amazing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is very much the work that Emily does in her book and her series. Um, so we will plug it again, Warren Stories. Now, final question. Um, anyone who has met me knows I'm obviously a deep watcher on the cutting edge of fashion. Um, <laughs> uh, but... <laughs> I say this as I'm sitting here in my schlubby t-shirt. But um, I have noticed, Emily, I have noticed that the, the pants are getting baggier. Uh, things are getting a little looser. Will the zoot suit, the upside down triangle, ever come back? Are we ever going to get that baggy again? Oh, yeah. I, I think it's I think it's come back in various, you know, I mean, you think about like suits in the 80s and like women's suits and, you know, double breasted suits. And um, I think that the, and shoulder pads, shoulder pads and, <laughs> you know, it leaves, it comes back, it gets like wider and looser and then it gets skinnier again. So, yes, uh, fully. And I and I do think as we emerge from the pandemic that people are going to be wearing clothing that is more celebratory um, Mm. and whatever that means to them. So that could be bright colors. That could be, you know, extravagant fabrics. My vision is that, you know, I want to get a custom tuxedo made. So maybe I will actually be inspired by this conversation and, 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 you know, do something that has, you know, big pants that are pegged at the bottom or something like that. I love it. I love it. You're going to see me in a ball gown walking down the sidewalk just (laughs) because. I think we should all be doing that. I think that, yeah, like I want, I want like the thing that I wear to like every single party and it is just like, you know, some bright over the top. Yeah. It's this, there's something celebratory that I think we're, we're craving. Um, Okay. Well, we're going to leave it there and listeners send us your photos and we'll pass them along to Emily Spivak. Uh, Emily, thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Uh, Nicole Hemmer. Thanks to you as always. Thanks, Jody. And Kelly Carter Jackson. Thanks to you. My pleasure. This Day in Esoteric Political History is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX, a network of independent, listener-supported, artist-owned podcasts. Our researcher and producer is Jacob Feldman. Our producer is Brittany Brown. You can get in touch with us with any questions or comments or ideas for the show. Email us thisdaypod at gmail.com, or you can find a form at thisdaypod.com. My name is Jody Avergan. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you soon.
Support for this day in esoteric political history comes from Odoo. If you feel like you're wasting time and money with your current business software or just want to know what you could be missing, then you'll need to join the millions of others who have switched to Odoo. Odoo is the affordable all-in-one management software with a library of fully integrated business applications that help you get more done in less time for a fraction of the price. To learn more, visit odoo.com slash this day. That's O-D-O-O dot com slash this day. Odoo, modern management made simple. Radiotopia. Radiotopia. 